Chapter 1 Thursday, May 27, SUP, TH, SUP, 1852. Today was a very trying day for me. We had journeyed only two miles when I broke a wagon wheel. I was ready to give up and sit on the side of the road weeping, wondering how I had ever thought I could make the drive to Oregon completely alone. But as usual, the kind Mr. Jensen stopped and helped me. Well, the whole company stopped, and I put us behind schedule but no one seemed to hold it against me. I'm so thankful the company has new captains because Mr. Bedwell would have left me alone there and gone on. He made no secret of the fact that he didn't think a woman could or should make this journey alone. I disagree with him, usually. I didn't for a while this morning, though. To thank Mr. Jensen for stopping to help me, I've invited him to partake of the supper I make this evening. I'm not certain it's a good idea, because it will mean we're alone, within plain sight of others, for a good long while. Mr. Jensen doesn't seem to speak much, so it will be up to me to carry the conversation. I'm sure I'll make it work, but it won't be the most pleasant experience I've ever had. I am thankful he helped me and has so many other times. I feel indebted to him, and it's not a feeling I like. I've offered to pay him for his help but he won't hear of it. A home-cooked meal is all he wants. I have to wonder if he knows I've cooked very little in my life before our journey west. Hopefully, he'll be satisfied with my meal. After the long drive that day, Penelope let Mr. Jensen see to her animals as he always did for her, and then she started the fire. She didn't know how she'd make it without the kind man helping her every step of the way. She'd promised herself, before leaving Virginia, that she wouldn't be beholden to anyone on this trip, and here she was, owing the blacksmith so much more than a simple meal. She started a simple meal she'd learned to make along the way, Johnny Cakes and Bacon. As soon as it was ready, she put it onto two plates and poured them each a cup of cold coffee from the pot she'd made that morning. She only hoped he'd be happy with cold coffee, because she had no idea what he drank. She did know the doctor insisted on drinking coffee and not water, but no one knew why, other than people who were coffee drinkers were less likely to get cholera. When he joined her a few minutes later, he took his cap off in her presence, reminding her of the men in Virginia who had always shown her the respect her father insisted she deserved. It's just Johnny cakes and bacon, she said softly. She watched his face carefully for a sign of contempt, but there was nothing. It sounds wonderful, he said, taking a seat on a rock beside the fire pit that had been formed long before by other travelers on their way to Oregon. Penelope handed him a plate. I'm learning to cook, but I'm not the best yet, so if you can't eat it let me know, and I'll make something else. She wanted to please him with the meal for all the help he'd given her along the way. She just wished there was something more she could do to thank him he took a bite and smiled. It's good. Only thing that would make it better would be honey or jam. She jumped up and went to the back of her wagon, finding a small jar of honey she'd purchased back in Independence, but hadn't tried yet. She wasn't sure why she hadn't broken into it when honey was one of her very favorite things, but at that moment, she was happy to have something to offer him. Here you go, she said handing it to him. Mr. Jensen smiled big and accepted it from her, pouring a bit over his Johnny cakes and then handing the honey to her. You'll like it this way. I promise. Penelope gladly accepted and poured a small amount onto her plate. I'm sure I'll love it. I just wish I'd been the one to think of it. She took a bite and smiled. This makes it a lot better. Thank you for inviting me to eat with you this evening, he said softly. His dark eyes seemed to be saying so much more, but she couldn't fathom what. It's the least I could do after all you've done for me. I was determined to do it all myself and you came along and made everything so much easier for me. I appreciate all you do. I'm happy to do what I can to make your journey easier. I wish you'd let me do more. His voice was earnest and she knew that he meant every word he said. He wanted to do more for her. 
What more could you do? she asked. You already feed and water my oxen, hitch them in the morning, unhitch them in the afternoon, and you make sure my wagon is in working order. I can't imagine what more anyone could do for me. I could set your tent up for you in the evenings, and then take it down in the mornings. She shook her head adamantly. I enjoy sleeping under the stars any night, it's not raining. And when it is raining, I have no problem climbing into the back of my wagon. Buying that tent was a silly luxury I don't really need. She wished she'd saved her money and the room in the back of the wagon, but it was too late now unless she wanted to leave it on the side of the trail. She didn't like how the entire trail seemed littered with emigrants' possessions though, and she had no desire to add to them. He sighed. You're going to be stubborn about this, aren't you, Miss Brainerd? I'm stubborn about a lot of things, she responded. It's what makes me who I am. She couldn't count the number of times her father had called her stubborn. She almost saw it as a compliment. You seem nervous about something, he said a short while later, when his plate had been cleaned. Like you're always watching over your shoulder. May I confide in you, Mr. Jensen, she asked. Only if you'll call me Herb. Herb. It must be short for Herbert, she thought. All right, Herb. I left my family's plantation without telling anyone where I was going. You see, I'm against slavery, and speaking those words aloud always made my father angry. He'd threatened to whip her if she ever said them again, so she'd held her tongue and bided her time until she was ready to leave. Did your family own slaves? he asked. She nodded. Hundreds of them. And you left all that behind to travel west by yourself? He seemed dumbfounded by her decision, and she knew it was one not many women would have made. Penelope shrugged. I do have the whole company as traveling companions. But no man to protect you. She frowned at him, narrowing her eyes. I have the safety of the whole company with me. I don't need a man to watch over me. The very idea of having a man turned her stomach a little. The man she'd been affianced to had been nothing short of evil. Herb nodded, but he seemed reluctant. All right. You don't think that's enough, do you? I don't know for sure, but I worry about people like Bedwell out and about at night with you all alone. Penelope nodded. Of all the men in this camp, he's the one who worries me the most. She thought for a minute about telling him about how terrible it had been when they'd both accepted a supper invitation from the Bentleys, but she didn't want him to know about it. She worried that he might take his protective nature a little too far if he found out. Herb leaned forward. I know you only invited me to have supper with you because you're grateful for my help, but I have a proposal. Penelope closed her eyes and said a silent prayer that he wasn't about to ask her to marry him. She knew that everyone seemed to get married quickly on the trail, but that wasn't something she wanted. Let's pretend we're courting, and then everyone will assume that you have my protection. His voice was soft and deep, and the very idea seemed to permeate the air around them. She opened her eyes, intrigued by the offer. What do you get out of this arrangement? I know that you'll be safer. Hopefully, a meal now and then. She bit her lip, considering. If you don't mind that you'll be getting my inept cooking, I would agree to cook for you every night. I'd need you to give me a portion of your food stores, but I really don't mind cooking. It's no harder to cook for two than it is for one. He smiled. I like that idea. What would this courting you're proposing entail? I don't want to be kissing you in front of others or anything like that. She'd never been kissed, and she didn't want her first kiss to be a fake one for others' benefit. And she wasn't sure yet how she would feel about kissing Herb. He was good to her, and that made him very attractive in her eyes, but kissing? It seemed terribly intimate. It wouldn't be kissing. I think I'd ask you to walk with me in the evenings after supper. We both need the exercise after driving all day. Perhaps you could take my arm and make it look more authentic, and then meals with you. Nothing more. 
I think that would work nicely. Penelope smiled at him. She would feel safer if people thought she had the protection of a man. It was in direct contrast to what she'd just been thinking, but she couldn't let that bother her. Good. Then that's what we'll do. He set his plate down. Would you care to walk with me, Miss Brainerd? If we're going to be courting, you'll have to call me Penelope, she said with a grin. Let me just take care of the dishes, and I'll be ready to go. She'd never in her life touched a dirty dish until she'd run away to go on the trail, but she had learned quickly how to do the dreadful chore, and she made short work of the task. When she was finished and the dishes were stowed away in the back of her wagon until morning, she walked to Herb's side. Let's take that walk now, she said, taking his arm. As they walked through camp in the direction they'd traveled that day, Penelope was aware that every eye was on them. It wasn't common to see either of them with a member of the opposite sex, and everyone was interested. As soon as they were out of sight of the camp, Penelope dropped his arm. She didn't want him to think she was flirting with him, because she really did just want to pretend to be courting. She'd been through enough in recent months, and she didn't want to start a relationship. She just wasn't ready. What makes a girl who was raised on a plantation leave home and go west on the trail with no one to help her? Penelope didn't want to tell him the full story. It still hurt too much, so she told him the same thing she'd told Betty Bentley. As a little girl, my mother was unable to nurse me, so one of the slaves was called in as a wet nurse. She'd had a little girl the very day I was born, and that little girl and I became the best of friends. We played and did everything together. My mother was mortified. He smiled. I think that sounds like a good friendship. It was. Muriel was the friend that kept me going. When we were ten, my father sold her to another plantation owner, separating her from her parents, just to get her away from me. I know that's why he did it, because he told me. He said that a girl of my station should never be friends with a slave's child. I see. Until that day, I'd never thought much about the fact that we owned these people who lived and worked on our land. But I couldn't get it out of my head. Every time there was a slave auction, I'd spend all night praying that Muriel would come back. Her mother cried for her every day. Penelope shook her head. It's a barbaric practice and I finally had enough of it. No matter how many times I begged my father to free our slaves, he refused. So, I left. My family doesn't know where I've gone. And if they did, he asked. I really don't know. I believe my father would force me to marry, so there would be no hope of me leaving again. He was already planning my alliance with a neighbor's son, but I begged for another year or two so I could be ready. When my mother agreed with me, he capitulated. We were to be married next month. And the thought of even kissing Reginald still turned her stomach as it had when she was back home. She knew she'd made the right decision. And how old are you? he asked. I was 18 in March. That's barely old enough to marry. I think a girl could marry for love at 18, but if it's an arranged marriage it would need to be a little later in life. Give the young lady a chance to meet someone she cares for, and then, if that doesn't work out, she can tell her father what qualities she's looking for in a husband so he can search for her. But that's only my opinion, of course, and I have no children. Tell me about you. Where are you from? I was born and raised in Independence. I've been helping people get their wagons ready to go west, but I'm ready to follow now. There are more blacksmiths than independents can really handle at this point. I like the idea of going somewhere that I'm needed. I do too. But who needs a debutante for anything? She didn't mention the dress shop she was thinking of opening when she arrived in Oregon, because that was something too new in her mind. No, she needed more time to mull over exactly how she wanted to do that. He smiled at her. Well, I could certainly enjoy having one in my life. She laughed softly. I don't know that I'm ready for that. 
I know you're not. I can see something more is bothering you than what you've told me. That's all right, though. You'll tell me when you're ready if you ever are. Thank you for understanding. It was strange, but she was drawn to this man. A lot more than she'd been drawn to her fiancé, Reginald. He stopped walking and turned. We've probably gone far enough. Next time we walk, I'll need to remember my rifle. There's no telling what we could run into here. Indians, you mean? She was afraid of running into a tribe of Indians. That was her biggest fear on the trail. Indians were wild and they liked to take white women as their own. No, not Indians. From what I understand they haven't been a big problem on the trail. No, I'm thinking about things like wild animals. Rattlesnakes and buffalo. And white men. She shuddered. You're talking to a girl who has been protected her entire life. The idea of encountering either of those is frightening for me. We haven't gone far from camp, and I really will remember my rifle next time. I can't believe I forgot it. Are you planning to settle near the others? She asked. Settle near the others? What does that mean? Several of the families are all planning to settle in the same area, so they can continue the friendships made on the trail. They think they'll be safer if they band together. Penelope had been invited to join the settlement, but she wasn't sure how people would feel about an unmarried woman running amok. It wasn't as if she knew how to do anything useful. Thankfully she had the pearls her mother had given her when she turned 16 and several other pieces of jewelry she could sell to keep her going. Until she found a husband of course. For a woman it was always about finding a husband. I didn't know that. I think it would be nice. Especially to settle somewhere near the doctor. I like knowing there's someone around to help if I'm sick. Or if I get burned. That's always the biggest fear for a blacksmith. A bad burn. She frowned. Have you been burned before? Herb shrugged. There's not a blacksmith who hasn't. He held up one of his hands. There were small scars covering it. Occupational hazard. Thankfully, I've never had a bad burn. My father did once and he has talked to me a dozen times about how to prevent something like that. I see. She didn't like the idea of him being burned. Not even a small one. She couldn't believe she was feeling protective of this man who had worked so hard to protect her. Thanks again for supper tonight, he said as they came within sight of camp. Thank you for all you've done for me. I don't know what I was thinking. I really did believe I could hitch my own team in the mornings and after the noon meal. I was very naive. She'd tried once and failed miserably. Thankfully, he was always waiting to help. Well, I'm happy to be able to help. Take my arm, he said, offering it. Let's make sure it really does look like we're courting. The men will be more likely to leave you alone that way. I haven't had any problem with the men in camp, she said, but she knew there always could be trouble. I know. Let's keep it that way. He walked her back to her camp. Thank you for a lovely time, he said loudly, hoping others would hear. I enjoyed myself, she said, not realizing until that moment, it was true. She hadn't expected Herb to be able to carry on a conversation, but it had been very nice. I will see you in the morning, and I do hope you'll join me for supper again tomorrow. I'd love to. After he'd walked off, she thought about what she could cook the next evening for him. She'd watched the other women cook, and she'd learned a few things. She would make a jerky gravy and serve it with some of her potatoes and carrots. It would be a lovely meal. At least she hoped it would. She pulled out her bedroll and climbed under the wagon where she slept many nights, thinking about what had brought her to where she was. The journey from Virginia to Independence had seemed awful at the time, but she now knew it had been easy compared to this portion of the trip. She'd at least been able to travel in a stagecoach then, and now, 
now she was driving a team of oxen 20 miles every day. It was a very different life than the one she'd always thought she'd live. But she couldn't abide even another day of slavery once she'd learned of Muriel's fate. How could she? Before she slept, she said a prayer for safe travels the next day, and another for Muriel's soul. Some believed that the slaves and all of those who came from Africa didn't have souls, but she knew better. When your life was entwined with one of the slaves, you came to understand the only differences between them and you were their circumstance and the color of their skin. Asterisk. Herb's prayer as he climbed into his bedroll was very different than Penelope's. He thanked God that she'd had trouble with her wagon and he'd had to come to her rescue. Since their time camped in Independence before their journey began, he'd had his eye on Penelope. He could tell she'd been gently bred, though her clothes were looking more and more like everyone else's as they traveled further and further. He'd wanted to go to her and beg for her hand in marriage that evening, already knowing how he felt about her, but he knew that it wasn't the right time. No, it would be better if they got to know one another a little better before they made such a huge decision. Well, she needed to get to know him better. He already knew she was the one he wanted to be with for the rest of his days. He prayed that their time together would make her be open to marrying him. He didn't know how it was going to come about, but it was his deepest desire, and those were things he always put before God. Asterisk. The following day was a typical day on the trail for Penelope. She'd imagined every day would be different and she would see many exciting things. And there were exciting things to see, on rare occasions. But most days were the same. Walking or driving along a dusty trail, beside a river. Monotonous, didn't begin to describe it. As she drove, Penelope had too much time to think about things she wished she didn't. She thought about the day Muriel had been sold, and her and her friends sobbing as they embraced one last time. She remembered the weeping Muriel's mother had done every time she looked at Penelope. The letter she'd received from her friend when they were twelve saying that she was living in the big house at her new plantation and things were going well. Then the letter saying that she was expecting a baby, praying no one would notice. And the final letter, which had come from the mistress of the house where Muriel had been sold. The letter that said Muriel was a husband thief and she had been whipped to death as soon as it was discovered she was carrying. She still carried that final letter with her at all times. It served as a reminder that people were cruel and that she didn't want any part of slavery. Ever. Penelope's thoughts were still on Muriel as she started supper that evening. She didn't know how she would have made it through cooking if it hadn't been for the book of receipts she'd found at the general store in Independence. She'd also had some time watching people cook as she had slipped into the kitchen whenever Muriel was required to be there to help with the work. She wasn't allowed to touch anything and had to sit watching quietly, but no one had told her parents she was doing something forbidden. Of course, Muriel never should have learned to read either but Penelope had been careful to listen to everything her teacher had said so she could teach Muriel. They'd never dreamed they would be separated at such a young age, but they were prepared when it had happened. Penelope made exactly what she'd thought about making, and when she tasted the gravy she smiled. It was actually good. There was a little more pressure on her to cook good meals with Herb sharing them with her. When she'd cooked for just herself it hadn't mattered nearly so much if the meal hadn't been perfect. After dealing with the livestock, Herb joined her at her fire. That smells good. I hope you like it. I don't have a chance to hunt, so I seem to always miss out on the fresh meat. Thankfully, Betty Bentley has become my friend, and she makes sure I get as much as she can without upsetting anyone else. I could hunt on Sunday if you'd like. Then we could dry the meat together. She pursed her lips. If I let you hunt for me, and help me dry meat, then I'll need to do your laundry in exchange. His eyes widened. You don't need to do my wash for me. If you're hunting for me, I do. I won't be a burden on anyone. Even a man as nice as you are. 
she handed him a tin plate with food piled high on it. She'd used more of her food reserves than she really should have, but he'd said he would share what he'd purchased for himself with her. It would all work out in the end. I don't want to be a burden on you, he said softly. You're not. You do so much for me already that I feel like I'm still taking advantage of you. Though I do appreciate everything you work so hard to do. We'll talk about it, he said, not willing to give in so quickly. She took a big bite of her food and smiled. It was the best meal she'd made all on her own, and she was rather proud of it, though she didn't say so, not wanting to seem as if she was bragging about her skills to him. He ate his full plate full without another word, and when he finished, he smiled. This was delicious. There's more, she said. There should even be enough for our noon meal tomorrow if you care to take it with me. I would really enjoy that. He noticed she hadn't baked bread like most of the women did, but perhaps she hadn't had enough time. Driving all day and then cooking at night would be difficult for anyone. Then that's what we'll do. It's nice not to have to eat all my meals alone. I was eating at Margaret Pruitt's table for ten cents a week. I'd rather eat with you. She smiled, blushing a little. I enjoy eating with you as well. Chapter 2 Saturday, May 29, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 I cannot wait until this evening when I can take Penelope into my arms and dance with her. I have waited for this moment from the first instance when I saw her in Independence. She is obviously from a family of wealth, but from what she's told me, I do not believe she cares if I have money or not. I don't know how she is funding her trip, but that doesn't matter to me. I'm simply glad she is here. Now that she's agreed to a pretend courtship with me, I feel that she will be willing to dance with me. If we don't dance, our story won't be nearly as credible. I have arranged with the other men to play without me so that I can make the most of the opportunity. They do not mind. After a long day on the trail on Saturday, they had a light supper on Saturday night, and when Penelope went to do her wash in the river with the other women, she asked Herb for his so she could do it as well. You can't do the wash tonight, he said. We need to dance, so people believe that we're truly a couple. She couldn't believe she'd already forgotten what they talked about. Yes, you're right. I'll do it tomorrow morning, before church service. While you do the wash, I'll try to get some meat for us. Thank you. I like the way we're sharing responsibilities, she said with a smile. They walked to the open area of the camp together for the dance, and she sat down on a rock that had been used as a chair many times before their company arrived in camp. I always enjoy the music while I do the wash. This is my first time to be a part of it. He smiled. It's my favorite time of the whole week. I enjoy church services a great deal as well, he added, not wanting her to think that he was an unrighteous man, but there is something about the music that fills my soul in a way no preaching ever could. I'm glad. I do enjoy dancing. She frowned at him. Don't you usually play with the others? Herb shrugged. I usually play the fiddle but the other men understand when there's courting to be done, it must take precedence. He held his hand out to her. I don't know any fancy dances. My dancing is more just moving to the music. I have been taught to follow any man's lead, she said softly, wishing she'd thought to wear one of her fanciest dresses. It would have felt so much more like home if she had, and despite her need to be away, she missed home a great deal. Well, then we should be able to dance together well. He led her to the middle of the dance floor and put a hand at her waist, looking into her beautiful green eyes. He'd dreamed of this moment for a long time. As they danced, she kept her eyes on his as she'd been taught and easily followed his lead. He wasn't a practiced dancer by any means, but he could move to the beat of the music, which she enjoyed. At the end of the dance, without thinking, she curtsied to him, and she felt every eye in camp on her. I guess I shouldn't have done that. It's all right. 
People don't care where you're from. They sat at the next dance, just listening to the music and watching the others dance. Penelope was surprised when a young lady walked into the middle of the dance floor, raised her arms, and began dancing alone. She moved in strange ways, and everyone gave her a wide berth. It was a good night, and Penelope was surprised by how much she enjoyed dancing with Herb. He was a good man, and she'd always liked him for that reason, but that night, she was drawn to him. Very drawn to him in a way that surprised her. Betty came over to talk to them for a moment, her daughter at her side. Are you enjoying the music? I love it. Penelope said. I think you know Mr. Jensen. He's the blacksmith. Yes, of course. Hello, Mr. Jensen, Betty said softly. It's nice to officially meet you. I think a lot of Penelope. I do too, he said, looking at the woman in question out of the corner of his eye. Will you be doing your wash in the morning, Penelope? Betty asked. I will. I hope to get a chance to visit with you then. Betty winked at her friend, and Penelope understood she wanted to know all about her being there with Herb. Of course, she did. Everyone in camp was curious about them. I'd like that a lot. Betty wasn't the kind of friend Muriel had been, and may never be, but it was good to have someone there in camp whom she felt she could confide some things in. As Betty walked away, heading toward Margaret Pruitt, Penelope watched her go, wishing she was more like Betty. Betty had reached out to her to try to befriend her, and she was the only person in camp who had done that so far. It was always good to have the courage to talk to strangers and that was something Penelope was usually lacking. Throughout the night, other people stopped by to talk to them, but mostly to talk to Herb. Men who wanted help with their wagons, or who needed new shoes, for their oxen, primarily. She hadn't thought about the fact that he would need to work on Sundays, because they moved every other day of the week, inch by inch getting closer to the promised land of Oregon. She didn't hold it against him, though because he did what he needed to do for the whole company. And the people who said that you couldn't work on Sundays were people who didn't take into account the fact that pastors only worked on Sundays. Did they criticize the pastor for working on the Sabbath? She wondered why no one else thought as she did about such things. After the dance, he walked her back to her camp and helped her spread her bedroll out under the wagon. It needed to be done, and he hated that she always did everything alone, even sleeping under her wagon instead of in a tent as she should have. He wanted to kiss her cheek goodnight, but he'd promised no kisses for show, and he didn't feel as if he could. Instead, he kissed her hand. I will see you tomorrow, and I will hopefully have meat in my hand. If you have too much work to do tomorrow, don't worry about meat. I can make do with what I have on hand. It wouldn't taste as good, but it would be filling. I'll keep that in mind. It depends on how many people come to me in the morning, he said. As Penelope watched him go to his own camp for the night, she wished she knew what to say to him. He was a kind man, and she was drawn to him, but she wasn't ready for more than that. Not for a good long while yet. Asterisk. The following morning, Herb was out trying to get some meat when a rider came up to him. Are you part of the wagon train up ahead? Herb nodded. Yes. Do you know if Penelope Brainerd is part of the train? Her father has paid me to find her and take her back to her fiancé in Virginia. Herb shook his head. Penelope Brain what? I don't think we have any Penelope in camp, he lied. He knew Penelope didn't want to go back, and he was determined to keep her from needing to. No matter what it took. I'm Herb Jensen, by the way. Simon Bradshaw. He reached out and shook Herb's hand. I'll keep an ear out for anyone named Penelope if you'd like. The man nodded. I'll ride on to the train ahead. I think she probably went with that group. He dug his heels into his horse's sides, racing past camp. Herb waited until the man was out of sight before heading back to camp himself. 
He had to find Penelope and let her know what was happening. When he reached the river, he saw her there with the other women doing her wash, and he called her name. She followed him, frowning. What is it? A man just rode up on a horse, not part of our company. He asked if you were part of our wagon train, saying that your father sent him to take you back to your fiancé in Virginia. I don't want to go back. She knew if her father didn't beat her for leaving, Reginald was sure to. No, she wasn't going back to Virginia no matter what it took. Herb frowned. I'm not sure you'll have much choice if he finds you. Penelope looked around her as if she was trying to find a place to hide. What can we do? He was thrilled that she included him in her troubles, automatically asking him to help her find a solution. We could marry. Then he would have no authority to take you back. She bit her lip. Mary? I'm not ready to marry. I know that. I wouldn't ask anything of you, in the bedroom way, but we need to get you safe and settled before the man comes back. He's on his way to the company, before ours. He hadn't intended to ask her to marry him so soon, but he prayed she'd agree. It would keep her safe, and it would mean he would get to call her his wife. He couldn't see a negative in the situation at all. Oh, good, but, she took a deep breath. The solution Herb was providing was a good one. Yes, let's marry, but I really do need time before, well, for your husbandly rights. I agree. I won't require anything of you until you're ready. And if I'm never ready? Then I'll never require anything. Herb said a silent prayer that she would return his feelings soon, because he didn't want to lead a life of celibacy, but for the time being, all that mattered was marrying her and making it seem as if they had consummated the marriage. We'll need to make sure that it looks like we've made love when the man comes back through. She nodded. Of course. Should we marry now or wait until after the church service? She would like a little time to mentally prepare for the wedding, but if it wasn't safe, then she would marry immediately. The man was on a fast horse. I think we should marry now. I don't know how far ahead of us the other company is. Herb wanted it taken care of anyway. The two of them walked to the preacher, Jedediah Scott, immediately. Will you marry us? Herb asked, skipping a greeting. He quickly explained the situation, and Jedediah agreed immediately. Ten minutes later, they were man and wife, and Penelope felt strangely. How was she supposed to act now? When Pastor Scott invited Herb to kiss her, she wanted to hide instead, but she obediently raised her lips. It was part of being married after all. Thankfully, Herb seemed to understand what she was feeling because he brushed a light kiss against her lips instead of a prolonged one like she'd seen in many weddings. It was still enough to send a jolt of electricity through her body, though, and she stared at him in surprise for a moment before heading back to get the laundry taken care of. As she walked back to the river where both of their wash was, he smiled. I'll go see if I can get some meat now. Herb. Yes? I can't thank you enough for always watching out for me. How did you thank a man for spending his time taking care of you when he wasn't required to? Could thanks ever be enough? I always will, he replied, picking up his rifle and walking back the direction he'd come from, more determined than ever to get some meat. There was plenty of other work to be done, but a wedding feast felt like something they should do as soon as they could. When Penelope knelt beside Betty again, her friend looked at her. What happened? My father sent a man to look for me and take me back to Virginia. Herb and I just got married to avoid me having to go back, but I feel strange about it. It won't be a real marriage, she whispered. Please don't tell anyone that's why we married. I wouldn't, Betty told her. I've discovered on this journey that there are many reasons to marry that are not all about falling in love. Marriage is so much more than that to so many people. I wasn't in love with Malcolm when we married, but now I'm very much in love with him. Sometimes it just takes a little while for your feelings to grow. 
I hope mine do, Penelope responded. I want to make Herb as happy as he's made me. Don't be afraid of the marriage bed, Betty said, a blush on her face. I know it sounds scary, and the way my mother described it made me want to hide forever, but the truth is, it's just lovely. She seemed embarrassed by her own words, but Betty was obviously determined to tell Penelope what she thought her friend needed to know. I, I'm not ready for that yet. Then you wait if he said it was fine. But the secret my sister told me is that if he kisses you and you feel all tingly or it makes your stomach turn, it means that you have feelings for him and you should share your bed with him. I will think about that. The kiss Herb had given Penelope had made her feel so much more than she'd imagined, and so had the dance. Did that mean she was ready for the marriage bed? She had no idea. None. After finishing the wash and hanging it between her wagon and herbs, she made a quick lunch for them to share. She realized she was going to need to sort through her belongings to combine them with his, but she, well, she wasn't ready to admit to the stash of jewelry she had hidden. She had friends whose husbands had sold off their jewelry for things they wanted that their wives didn't. No, she wasn't going to put herself in a position where that could happen. They had lunch together, and she felt shy as she mentioned combining their rigs. Does that mean I can start walking with the other women? she asked. She liked the idea of being able to take her place with the other females and not always having to drive. I suppose it does, he said with a smile. I would try really hard, for a while, to wear dresses as plain as you can find. Don't let yourself stick out in any way. If it happens that you're found here, he can't drag you away, but it'll be better to avoid this situation entirely. That makes sense, she said softly. Should I work on sorting our things this afternoon? Do you mind if I dig through your wagon? He shook his head. I have nothing to hide. I won't be able to help you, because I have other things to do, but I did get a rabbit for our supper. Oh, good. Do you like rabbit stew? She knew there was a receipt for rabbit stew in her book and she was getting good at following the instructions exactly. I do. I like it a lot. With that, he got to his feet and leaned down to kiss her cheek. It was nice he was able to do that now, and then he headed off to talk to one of the men he needed to work with that afternoon as soon as church services were over. So much to do on a Sunday. Every week it was this way. Betty came to help Penelope with her work that afternoon, and the two of them got Penelope's wagon emptied and herbs loaded. His was slightly larger than hers, so it made sense to combine all their things into his wagon. She hid her jewelry at the bottom of his flower sack, not wanting to admit to it yet. Penelope was certain her friend saw her do it, but Betty said nothing about it, so she pretended it hadn't happened. After church, which was held a little later than usual that day, Penelope began the process of making the rabbit stew. She was careful to follow the instructions in her receipt exactly so that it would turn out in a way she could be proud of. She looked into her empty wagon as the food cooked, knowing it would just end up being more debris along the side of the trail, and she had to not worry about leaving her wagon behind. It had been her first home away from her parents, and her first taste of freedom, and she was loath to leave it behind, but she knew it was the symbol of her freedom she wanted to keep and not the object itself. When Herb came back to their fire for supper, he said, I have one more set of oxen to reshod after supper. I'm sorry our first day as man and wife will have to be interrupted that way, but I don't really have a choice. Penelope nodded. I understand. You have to do your job. She wondered if he was paid for the little jobs he did along the trail, but she decided not to ask. She couldn't question his finances if she didn't want him questioning hers. This stew turned out very well, he said, smiling at her. I had no idea you were such a good cook. She smiled. I didn't either. I bought a book of receipts in Independence but other than that, the only cooking I've ever been party to was watching as my childhood friend learned to cook back in Virginia. 
you're doing remarkably well for a woman who has never cooked before. Her cooking certainly wasn't the best Herb had ever tasted, but she was doing an admirable job. Thank you. She wasn't sure if he was only being kind or if he actually meant it but either way, she was pleased. Learning to cook hadn't come naturally to her, and she worked at it every day. While she washed dishes, he went off to shoe the last pair of oxen. He still wasn't back when she finished, so she took their clothes off the line and carefully folded them. They couldn't look perfect on the trail, but at least they would be clean. She wasn't about to iron while they were traveling this way. When Herb arrived back, she was just putting the last of the clothes away. Would you like to walk now that supper is over? he asked. I would. I'd like that very much, she responded. She was surprised at how much she'd begun to look forward to their walks. Together, they walked the trail where they had traveled the previous day, and she held his arm tightly the entire time. This time it was a bit harder for her to keep up appearances, because they were married, and it felt so strange to her. When they had gone as far as he wanted, and they were about to turn around and walk back, she stepped close to him. I'd like you to kiss me with no one watching, please. She needed to know if the tingles happened as Betty had said they would. She wasn't sure if it was just something that had happened during the wedding, or if it would be normal for her. When Herb took her into his arms and slowly lowered his mouth to hers, she held her breath, waiting to see what would happen. His lips touched hers, and she felt it again. The butterflies in her stomach and the tingles rushing through her body. He made her feel things she'd never felt before, and she loved feeling them. She wanted to always feel them. Her arms wrapped around him and she moved closer to him, tilting her head to one side. Herb simply gathered her to him and continued kissing her. Finally, she broke off a kiss, staring up at him with surprise. That was amazing. He smiled. I always knew when I got the chance to kiss you, it would be that way. Special for both of us. He was pleased she'd found it pleasing as well. It was special for you too, she asked. He nodded. I've never courted anyone seriously, so it was really my first kiss too. He stroked her cheek. Thank you for sharing it with me. What are we going to do if that man comes back, she asked, not able to keep her mind focused on him now that the kiss was over. The man was constantly hanging over her head, dangling there like a machete about to fall and kill her. He will come back, Penelope. And what we'll do is tell him we're married, and he can't have you. I'll make sure the other men in camp know that he will be coming around, and together we'll make a plan. Just make sure you don't go off alone. I'll do my best. He frowned. If you have to walk without a man near you, then make sure Mary is there. Mary always has that musket of hers, and I can be certain she can protect you if I'm not there to do it. Would you teach me to shoot? she asked. I would like to be able to take care of myself if at all possible. I will start that tomorrow evening. The light is getting too dim now. I'll stay close to Mary tomorrow. Penelope didn't know Mary well, and she certainly wasn't a close friend of hers, but she would stay with her. She would do anything to avoid going back to Virginia and having to marry Reginald. As they walked toward camp, she stayed close to him, clinging to his arm. Her eyes watched in every direction as she worried that the man her father had sent was behind every bush. There, ready to grab her and drag her back to Virginia, kicking and screaming if necessary. When they got back to camp, Herb put up her tent. I don't need a tent, she told him. We need a tent though, he said loudly. It's the only way we'll have privacy for our wedding night. She blushed as she realized that he had just announced to the entire camp that he planned to consummate their marriage that night. She knew he wouldn't, but it was best if everyone thought they were. Of course, it made sense that he had said it so loudly, whether she liked it or not. Once the tent was erected, she climbed into it, spreading out her bedroll. 
he put his in with hers and set it as far from hers as possible. I know I promised you not to make love yet, and I plan to keep that promise, but it has to look like something is happening between us. Yes, I understand, she said. She lay atop her bedroll, staring up at the tent. It was odd to be in this position, and it certainly wasn't how God wanted them to be. No, he intended for men and women sleeping together to be intimate. There was no doubt about it. He reached over and touched her hand. Good night, Penelope. Good night, Herb. And that was that. Their wedding night had been successfully accomplished, and now they could continue on with their marriage. It would be easy from here. It had to be. As Penelope lay there, she closed her eyes and thanked God for the fact that Herbert had been the one to intercept the man her father had sent. No one else would have known to say she wasn't there. Or to send the man on. No one else would have married her immediately to save her from having to go back to Virginia. Beside her, Herb thanked God for the opportunity to make Penelope his wife so much sooner than he thought he'd be able to. Life was going to be different now that they were together. Her problem had become his perfect time to convince her that she needed to be his wife for more reasons than just trying to escape a fiancé she cared nothing for. He loved her, and he prayed he'd be able to get her to love him back. Chapter 3 Monday, June 1, 1852 I find myself married to a virtual stranger, and I'm not sure how to feel about it. When a man came to camp looking for me, I did what I felt I needed to do, but I'm very fearful of what he'll do when he comes back through. I'm thankful to be married to Herb, who is making a plan with the other men to protect me when Mr. Bradford comes back through, but I pray the plan will be unnecessary. I will do whatever I have to do to hide from the danger that is coming for me. I must. I cannot go back to Virginia and the life I left there. I cannot. Penelope went in search of Mary Hastings as soon as the wagons pulled out the following morning. Herb asked me to make sure I'm always with you, and you have your musket with you, she said quietly. Mary frowned. Herb is the blacksmith? Penelope nodded, realizing she hadn't known the man's name until a couple of days ago, and she shouldn't expect others to know it just because she did. There's a man who is looking for me. He was told I'm not part of this company yesterday, but I'm almost certain he'll be back. His name is Simon Bradford, and he wants to take me back to someone who will hurt me. Are you in trouble with the law? Mary asked, looking skeptical. Not at all. My father isn't pleased that I left our home instead of marrying the man he chose for me. I just couldn't stay there and be part of that culture for another minute. Penelope said a silent prayer that Mary would agree to be her protector during the day. I see. Yes, I'll keep my musket with me and spend all my time with you when Mr. Jensen can't. Thank you. In return, if you see an animal let me know. I want fresh meat for supper tonight. Mary had always seemed very single-minded to Penelope. She wanted to hunt and that's what she did. Penelope smiled. And if there's enough fresh meat, you'll share? Mary laughed. Of course, I will. I love to share. As they walked and talked, Penelope was surprised by how much like herself Mary was in some ways and how very different they were in others. Sounds like you married quickly, as most have on the trail. Do you like your new husband? Penelope choked. Of course, I like him. Who would ask such a thing? Mary shook her head. There's no of course about it. I love Bob with everything inside me, but today, I don't like him very much. You don't? No, I don't. He said the eggs I made for breakfast had shells in them, and I know they didn't, so I'm going to be mad at him for a while. Mary said the words as if they were a pronouncement, and she didn't care who felt differently about it than she did. You're just choosing to be angry? Penelope thought that was quite odd. Sure. I'll be angry until mid-morning, 
and by the time we stop for our noon meal, I'll like him again. It's a good system when he's driving all day. Mary shrugged, and Penelope took that to mean it was something the other woman did often. I see. Penelope really didn't know what to think of that, so she changed the subject by asking about where Mary had grown up, and then Mary took over the entire conversation. It was easy enough to get her to stop talking about her choice to be angry with Bob. When they stopped for the noon meal, Mary stayed with Penelope until Herb was there with them, and Herb nodded his thanks to Mary. Thank you for watching over her the way you have. I hope you know I really appreciate it. I'm happy to do it, Mary said as she hurried off to eat with Bob. What's for lunch? Herb asked. I have a feeling you're going to be asking me that a lot in the days to come. Penelope liked that he was dependent on her for his meals, just as she was dependent upon him for protection. Of course, I will. It's my job. He grinned at her as she pulled out what was left of the rabbit stew from the evening before. She scooped up two bowls of the concoction and handed him one of them. He licked his lips in anticipation. This is going to be just as good the second time around, he said, taking the spoon she gave him and eating it happily. Rabbit stew was my favorite meal when I was a boy. My mother never made it, but every time I went to a friend's house, his mother served it. I don't think I'd ever had it before last night. He gaped at her for a moment before nodding. I forget how privileged your background was. Everything I ever had was built on the backs of men and women from Africa. Our family owned over a hundred slaves. There were ten working in the house and countless more in the fields. She shook her head, thinking of the suffering her life of luxury had brought to so many others. Your house must have been enormous. There were eight bedrooms, she told him. I had a teacher who was there to teach only me. Did you have no brothers and sisters? A younger brother. My father always wanted to make a good match for me, so he could leave the plantation to someone he trusted until my brother came along. I think that's one of the reasons I want to go west. I think I should be able to own property whether I'm a man or a woman, and out west it doesn't matter so much. That's a really good point, he said. I agree that women should be able to own property and to not be beholden to men for everything they have. I'm just glad we both chose the same wagon train to go west. So am I, she said, smiling shyly. I certainly didn't expect to marry before we were halfway there. I didn't either, but I can't say that I'm disappointed things turned out this way. I'm married to the prettiest woman west of the Mississippi. No other man can say that. She laughed. I don't think you can say it either. I'm not pretty. I'm just, well, I'm me. She'd always been told she was pretty by her parents, but she could hear Muriel's mother's voice in her ear. Pretty is as pretty does. You be nice to people, and you'll be the prettiest girl in all Virginia. She hated being called pretty now. It was what was on the inside of her that mattered. Well, I'd have to fight anyone who tried to say it, he said. You're not going to fight with someone just because they think someone else is prettier than me. That would be ridiculous. I suppose it might, but I'd do it anyway, because I don't like it when other men lie to me, and there's no one around half as pretty as you. She shook her head. Maybe I should wash our dishes. He chuckled. Afraid you're going to lose this argument? Not at all. I know I will so, I'm not going to keep talking about it. She gathered their dishes and the empty pot the stew had been in and added cold river water to the hot water she'd had boiling since before they started the meal. I told Mary what she needed to know about the danger to me. I hope you don't mind that. I don't at all. I'm just glad someone else will be watching your back when I can't be with you. I do need to take the time to drive all day. I know you do. I'll feel safer since I'll have the time with Mary. Penelope shrugged. She can be odd at times, but I really think I like her. 
And I like you, Herb said, grinning at her. Let me wipe the dishes while you wash them. That's women's work, she protested. And you've been doing men's work since we left independence. It doesn't hurt me one bit, he said. Just like the men's work has never hurt me. No, it hasn't. Penelope was glad he wasn't a man who minded helping with women's chores. It would make things much easier for them in the future. She stored their lunch dishes into the back of the wagon as soon as they were dry, knowing they'd have to head out again soon. When they parted ways to begin their afternoon journey, Herb waited until Mary was there to watch over Penelope. He realized he was probably being overly cautious, but he found he didn't care. Thank you, he said to Mary as he headed to the wagon. They were halfway through their afternoon drive when the wagon in the front of the line stopped, causing all of the others to stop as well. Mr. Bradford was going down the line of wagons, showing each driver something. When he got to Herb, he was shown a sketch of Penelope. He shrugged as if he didn't know anything and then the man moved on. He'd briefed all the other drivers that morning about how there was someone looking for his wife and they all agreed to try to conceal her identity as best they could. He wanted to jump down and go and protect his wife, but it would be telling. He just had to pray that everyone did as they'd said they would. When the wagon started rolling again, he worried until Penelope came up to walk beside him. Mary realized what was happening, and she hid me in the pastor and Hannah's wagon. She'd known he'd need to see her to believe she was all right so she'd made sure to go to him as soon as she could. Oh good. Everyone denied knowing you? Yes. Thank you for letting everyone know to hide me. They're not taking you back as long as I'm alive. I'm grateful. Though she knew if it came to it, she wouldn't let her brisk his life for her. He was too precious to be thrown away like the trash that littered the trail. He frowned at that, not wanting her gratitude. You're my wife. It's my job to protect you. I know, she said softly, returning to her spot beside Mary. When they stopped that evening, there was fresh venison that Mary had gotten with her musket, and Penelope decided to make a roast from it. She put the roast into her pot, added some carrots and some rice, and then she added water. Mary had given her advice on how to make the meat into a tasty meal, so she covered it and put it right into the fire. It was something she'd never cooked, not having known enough people to share in the meat before that day. She was happy to be able to make a good meal, for Herb though. She had started some bread rising while they were on their noon meal, and she tucked that into the fire as well. When Herb finished with the livestock, he stopped by the fire. I need to change some shoes on a pair of oxen. Will supper hold? It was nowhere near ready yet, so Penelope nodded and sent him on his way. Mary had set up camp right beside her, and Penelope and Herb both knew she was safe, so they didn't worry about him being gone for a short while. By the time he returned, she had supper ready, and she fixed their plates. How was your first day walking? he asked. It was good. I'm a little sore from it, but I expect that to be a constant thing until we reach Oregon. It probably will be, he said. I hope you enjoyed your time with the other women. I did. I walked with Mary, Hannah, Margaret, and Betty. The only one of them I really knew before today was Betty. She frowned. I feel like I should make an effort to get to know Trudy. She and I were the only women on this trip alone and I don't think I realized just how lonely I was until today, when I had companions again. I think she needs a friend. Then you should be that friend, he said. You can do that. I'm going to try. Do you mind if I invite her to share our supper tomorrow evening? she asked. Not at all. You might also want to invite the widow we found on the side of the trail and her family. I cannot remember her name, but it would be nice for her to join us. I'd like that a lot, she said, nodding. I'll make sure to ask her to join us tomorrow night. Or ask Trudy tomorrow and ask the widow on Wednesday. 
either way. I think we'll both be happy to have some company at meals and to make new friends. Do you have trouble making friends? she asked, a little surprised. Sometimes, he said. I'm a quiet man by nature, and I don't like to talk about religion, politics, or the weather, which seem to be the only things men ever want to talk about. You should join the women then. We talk about quilting, and food, and doing the wash. Penelope grinned at him. I think I'll forego that stimulating conversation and spend my time alone, thank you very much. Penelope laughed. I guess we could just talk to each other, but we might get bored with that as well. We might, but I don't think we will. We're good at talking to one another. He smiled, reaching out and stroking her cheek in a gesture that was starting to feel familiar to her. You're a good man, Herb. I like that about you. I like everything about you, he said, not even joking a little bit. She was a wonderful woman. Do you want to walk after dishes? Or are you too tired from walking all day? She shrugged. I wouldn't mind a leisurely walk, but if I start whimpering, it's time to turn around and come back to camp. That sounds reasonable to me. I'll try not to do anything to make you whimper. Good. I hate acting like a small child. We all do, but sometimes it helps to whimper. I don't know why, but it does. And then you have to just put your chin up and deal with the pain. That makes a lot of sense to me, she said. I'll do my best to keep my chin up all the time. I hope you will. During their walk, they walked up the river in the direction they hadn't gone yet and he had his rifle at his side. You usually want to walk the other way, she said. That's the way the man looking for you went. Do you think he'll be back? she asked, frowning. I assumed the danger was over. I do think he'll be back. He's not giving up. He had a portrait of you that I wanted to steal from him so I would have a portrait of you. But he showed all the drivers. Herb shook his head feeling like the situation was more dire than ever. She bit her lip. Maybe I should leave, so I'm not putting anyone else in danger. We're in the middle of the Oregon Trail. You are not going to go anywhere that I don't go with you. All right. She didn't want to go anywhere, and it wasn't just that she was worried about the man looking for her. She didn't want to leave her new husband. She didn't know where that thought was coming from, but it was definitely there. He put his arm around her waist, and she rested her head on his shoulder. It feels like letting you touch me is still doing something wrong. He laughed. It's not. We're married now. I know. I just, well, I have very strict etiquette in my head, and I feel like I'm doing something wrong when I don't follow whatever it says. Nowhere does it say you can't touch the man you married, does it? Herb asked. No, but we haven't been married long enough that it feels like I should let you touch me. Do you want me to wait ten years before I put my arm around you? He asked, a grin on his face. No, I think we're good. She smiled up at him for a moment. Thank you for doing so much to keep me safe. I'm happy to do whatever you need, he said. Penelope stopped walking. I feel like this is the only place we can kiss. Out here on the prairie when no one can see us. I'm happy to kiss you whenever you want wherever you want. Kissing you is one of my favorite things, actually. Then kiss me now. This time, Herb wasn't as tentative with his touch. He stroked his hands up and down her arms as he molded his mouth to hers parting her lips for the first time and meeting her tongue with his own. She gasped with surprise. I don't think you're supposed to do that. We're married. I can kiss you however I want. To prove the truth in his words, he kissed her again, much more deeply this time. Her arms went around his neck and she clung to him. When he finally broke off the kiss, they were both out of breath. We need to stop that or I'm going to lay you down in the grass and do something I've promised not to do until you're ready. Her eyes widened. 
I wasn't trying to give you permission to do that. He sighed, resting his forehead against hers. I know you weren't. You were just enjoying the kiss, and that's okay. Just know that too many kisses like that, and I'm going to want a lot more from you. I see, she said, taking a deep breath. Perhaps in a week or two, when we feel the danger has passed, I'll feel more comfortable about that. I sure hope so, he said. There's nothing I want more than to make love to you at this very moment. Penelope bit her lip. I owe you so much. I will let you have your wedding night tonight if you need it so badly. He shook his head. When we finally have a wedding night, you will need it as badly as I do. I promise you this. Are you certain? I feel badly making you wait when you gave up your freedom just to help me. Penelope wasn't sure why he was so kind to her, but she certainly couldn't complain about it. It wasn't just to help you, Penelope. I gave up my freedom because I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. There's no other reason. She looked at him in surprise. But, you asked me to marry you because that man was looking for me. Yes, I did. I would have waited for you to get to know me a little better before I asked if he hadn't come around, but I still would have asked. He stopped walking and looked into her eyes. I've been watching you since, before we left Independence. I knew the first moment I saw you that I wanted to spend my life with you. You did? She didn't even remember when she'd first seen him. Why hadn't she noticed him? Even as she thought about why, she knew the answer. It was because he was a quiet man who didn't attract attention. It was one of her favorite things about him. When they got back to camp, they erected their tent and bedded down for the night. As soon as they were in their respective bedrolls, she reached out to him. Are you certain you don't want to? I'm certain I do want to, but I'm also certain it will be better for you if we wait, so that's what we're going to do. You're a special woman, Penelope, and I don't want to rush you. Thank you, Herb. She rolled toward him and pressed her lips to his cheek. You're the best man I could have asked for. I see that now. I'm glad you think so. And he hoped she was telling the truth about only waiting a week or so. He wasn't sure how much longer he'd be able to wait. He really had no idea how difficult it would be to lie next to this woman every night and not make love to her the way he wanted. As soon as she closed her eyes, Penelope thanked God for him. And she thanked him for the entire wagon train being willing to pretend they had never seen her. She hadn't obeyed her father by leaving, but God had sent her Herb anyway. A man who was taking care of her. She didn't know what she could have possibly done to deserve a man like him but whatever it was, she was glad she'd done it. When she closed her eyes to sleep, she realized it was the first night she'd forgotten to pray for Muriel's soul, so she added that to her prayer as well, wishing her friend was there with her. But she knew, deep down, that if her friend had still been there, she never would have left on the trail or married. And she would still not see a problem with slavery. Chapter 4 Tuesday, June 2, SUP ND, slash SUP, 1852. I have taken the lovely Penelope Brainerd as my bride. I will not explain the circumstances now, except to say I must now find a way to protect her from a past she is trying to escape from. We continue along the north branch of the Platte River for a few more days, praying that no rain comes before we find the right place to cross. This is one of the most dangerous crossings of our entire journey. Before they started out on Tuesday morning, Penelope found Trudy to ask her to join them for supper that night. We were the only two women on this journey alone, and now it's only you. I feel like that should be sufficient for us to become friends, Penelope explained. I'm not so sure, Trudy said. I don't need any friends. Sure, you do. Everyone needs companionship. Tell me what has you so frightened. Trudy looked over her shoulder and all around, as if she was hiding something, but Penelope couldn't get her to budge on what it was. Please just come eat with us. 
It'll save you from having to cook tonight, and I'm sure you're tired of cooking for one. Of course, I'm tired of cooking for one. Trudy kicked at a rock on the ground. All right, I'll come to supper, but you're not to ask me any questions. I won't ask anything other than how your day was. I won't tell you where I'm from or why I'm going to Oregon, Trudy warned. Then I'll be certain not to ask those questions in particular. Penelope had no idea what the other woman's problem was, but she was willing to befriend her anyway. She truly felt badly for the prickly woman. As they walked that day, she asked Mary to try to find her another bit of meat for her pot that night. I'm having my first guest as a married woman, and since I can't serve a meal on China, I feel like I should at least serve some meat. Mary laughed softly. I'll see what I can do. I like to be the provider of meat for many people, so let's see if we can spot a buffalo today. Mary had told Penelope that she was sad she hadn't been the first to bring in a buffalo from their wagon train, and Penelope knew her friend meant it. The girl loved to hunt more than anything, it seemed. By noon, they had a buffalo, and they hung it from the back of the wagon Mary shared with Bob. We'll need to strip it at lunchtime and distribute the meat, Mary said. It's going to break the wagon otherwise. It's just too heavy to do it this way. Penelope nodded. I'm happy to do that. I will help in any way I can. Have you ever helped carve up a buffalo into roasts? Mary asked, looking at Penelope, who she obviously thought was too frail for many of the things they were doing. I haven't, but I will. It wasn't something she'd ever done, but only because she'd never had the opportunity. She didn't think it would bother her too terribly much, and if it did, she'd get over it. Mary smiled. I knew you were made of stronger stuff than you look like you are. I certainly hope I am, Penelope said. She knew she looked like she needed someone to take care of her, but she felt like she'd done a good job so far in doing all that she possibly could. After their noon meal, while most of the camp napped around them, Penelope, Herb, Bob, and Mary carved up the buffalo, portioning it out for different families. Penelope and Herb took a larger chunk than they usually would because they were sharing their supper with Trudy. Mary took some for her mother's family, some for Hannah and Jedediah, some for Betty and Malcolm, and some for Margaret and Jamie and their girls. Penelope asked for some she could give the widow, Mrs. Gabriel, and Mary made sure she cut off a nice large slab for the family that the previous wagon train had left behind. After that, they offered it to many of the other travelers, because they didn't want to have to dry it that day. No, it would be good for everyone to have fresh meat anyway. As they parted ways, leaving the bones on the side of the road to be found by the next company to come through, Herb grinned at Penelope. Nice friend you have there. I know. She's better with her musket than most men are. She smiled at him. I'll take this to Mrs. Gabriel after putting ours in the back of the wagon. I can't wait to cook tonight. Penelope had found she took great pleasure in cooking when the ingredients were plentiful as they were that night, and she was already planning what she would cook for supper with their guest. She took the second roast to the widow, who accepted it gratefully. I can't pay for this. No one would ever ask you to, Penelope said with a smile. She liked what she knew of the other woman, and she was so happy that she could help in some small way. Thank you. You're very welcome. I was wondering also if you and your family would like to have supper with my husband and I tomorrow evening. I'm not sure yet what I'll make, but whatever it is, I would like you to share it with us. The widow nodded, looking excited, which wasn't an emotion Penelope had ever seen on her face. We would be pleased to join you. May I make a bread and dessert? Penelope nodded. That would be wonderful, thank you for the offer. As she hurried back to camp, she was glad she'd reached out to the woman. She had four children, and she was fighting hard to keep going after her husband's recent death. By the time Penelope returned to their wagon, Herb was hitching up the team. That was one noon break that was over too quickly, she said. 
Usually there was time to rest before they started their afternoon travels, but with the carving of the buffalo, there was no time at all. Herb nodded, finishing his task and then kissing her cheek. I look forward to some time alone with you this evening, wife. And I look forward to time alone with you, she said, falling into line with the other women as the wagons lined up to drive away. Mary was very animated that afternoon, talking to everyone about something that had happened back in Independence, and making them all laugh. That was one of the best things about Mary in Penelope's opinion. She was fun to talk to, and she told the best stories. Penelope found herself walking beside Hannah, the pastor's wife that afternoon, and Penelope found she was very intimidated by the other woman. It was odd to be with her, because she didn't seem to be one of those holier-than-thou preacher's wives. No, she was more like all the other women. It was refreshing to see how sweet she was. Is it hard being married to a pastor? Penelope asked. No harder than being married to a blacksmith, I'm sure, Hannah grinned. I love Jed, and I'd love him if he was a grave digger. He's a very good man. I've noticed that about him. My herb surprises me with what a wonderful man he is. I barely knew him when we married, but I find myself feeling closer to him every day. Penelope realized she had been truly blessed with a man like Herb. He cared for her a great deal. Jed says he's a good man, and I believe him. He does a lot of work on the trail for people, and he never expects even a dime in payment. He keeps saying that all of us arriving in Oregon, together, will be his payment. Penelope smiled at that. We've talked about settling close to the rest of you, and I hope it goes well. I'm sure it will. We have ranchers, farmers, a pastor, a doctor, and now a blacksmith. I think we're all going to be very happy in a little community together. We just have to find the right place. Hannah seemed excited at the prospect of finding just the right place. I'm sure that won't be too difficult. I hope not. Everyone is happy we don't have to say goodbye to each other at the end of the trail. There are a few I wouldn't mind saying it to, but then I remember I'm a Christian, and I love my neighbors. Penelope laughed. I didn't know preachers' wives were allowed to think like the rest of us. Apparently we are, because God has not yet struck me with lightning. He's a good God. There you go again, Hannah, talking religion, Margaret said with a wink at Penelope. Hannah shrugged. It's my lot in life. You did marry a preacher, Betty said with a smile. And you married the doctor. What does that say about our intelligence? Hannah asked. I don't know what it says for yours, but I hope for me it means I won't have sick children. Betty looked toward her new daughter who was playing with Margaret's children, obviously making sure she was safe. They all laughed. I'm having supper with Trudy tonight, Penelope said, wondering how the others would feel. Betty wrinkled her nose. She's not terribly pleasant, but I hope you have a nicer time with her than I did. I will try, Penelope said, wondering what it was about Trudy that she wanted to keep people at arm's length. Penelope was truly just trying to be a friend, and Trudy had already slapped away her hand many times. Penelope started cooking immediately after they arrived at their campsite for the night, and she turned the meat she'd been given into a roast with potatoes and carrots, and she made a gravy for it all. She didn't have time to bake a loaf of bread, but she was sure there was enough other food that they'd be all right anyway. By the time Herb came to join her, Trudy was heading their direction. Penelope smiled wide. How was your day? Trudy shrugged. I drove all day like I do every day. Are you looking forward to actually finding the elephant? Penelope asked, referring to their arrival in Oregon. In some ways I am, Trudy said. I like the idea of having my own parcel of land that no one can take away from me. That's what I'm really excited about. I'm sure that will happen for you very soon, Penelope said. I didn't plan to share my parcel with anyone either, but Herb came along, and I have to now. 
she winked at her husband to let him know she was only joking. I won't be marrying ever, Trudy said, her eyes looking haunted, but Penelope knew better than to ask what had happened to her. I said that once too. Penelope shrugged. I do hope you find happiness in whatever form it presents itself. With that, she served the plates handing one to Trudy first. I'm so glad you're joining us for supper tonight. Me too, Trudy said. I think I could get used to you. Penelope noticed the other woman hadn't said she could be her friend. Just that she could get used to her. She'd have to take it for what it was. Herb looked annoyed, but Penelope shook her head. She hoped he knew that meant that she didn't think he should say anything about the way Trudy was acting. For Trudy, her demeanor was sunshine and flowers compared to how it usually was. While they ate, Penelope steered the conversation towards subjects that wouldn't upset the other woman. I hope it's not as hot in Oregon as it is here, she said. From what I've read, the temperature is supposed to be mild. That's what I've read as well, Herb said, following her lead. I enjoyed walking with Hannah and the other ladies today, Penelope said. Hannah is different than any preacher's wife I've ever met. In a good way, of course. No two people are the same, and you really can't treat them as if they are, Trudy said. Someone may do something that seems deplorable, but when you understand their reasons for it, it's not as bad as it seemed. Can you give us an example of what you mean? Herb asked. Trudy shrugged. What if someone stole a loaf of bread? The act is deplorable. But then you find out he has six children to feed, his wife died, and he has no way to earn money. His motives are good while his actions are wrong. You have to look at each person and judge their motives before you decide they're terrible people. That's really true, Penelope said. She was surprised the other woman had such deep thoughts about anything with her unfortunate behavior. Perhaps she was explaining in her own way that no one should judge her actions. Only her motives. After supper, Trudy left, not offering to wash the dishes, but Penelope hadn't expected her help. She knew the other woman well enough to know that it wouldn't be part of the evening, and it didn't bother her. As soon as the dishes were done, she covered her yawn with her hand. I think I'm going to have to forego our walk this evening. Herb frowned. Aren't you sleeping well? Would you be if you knew that someone was trying to force you to go somewhere you don't want to be? Penelope just wished she could get Simon Bradford and the fact he was looking for her out of her mind. Herb frowned. I'm not letting him take you anywhere. I know you're not. Penelope wasn't truly convinced though. It was still possible she could be found and forced to go back. It wouldn't be her preference, but it could certainly happen. And then where would she be? She'd once heard Reginald talk about how you should treat a wife like she was one of your slaves. If she didn't do as she was told, she needed to be whipped to within an inch of her life. She knew that Herb would never think or say anything like it and she thanked God for his kindness. There was no way she was going to be Reginald's wife, and there was no one who could force her to do so. When she prayed that night, she thanked God for saving her from the men trying to hurt her. And she prayed for Muriel's soul. Because Muriel needed her prayers more than anyone else she knew. Beside her, Herb reached out to her and pulled her against him, holding her. I wish I could ease your worries. You can't. No one can. She sighed and nestled her head against his shoulder. I'll be all right. I just need to get used to the idea that I could be taken at any time. But don't worry about me. If I'm taken, I'll just find a way to escape. Again and again. I won't stay with him or anyone else who owns slaves. I'm my own person, and I don't think anyone can forget it. Once she had spoken her intention aloud, she was able to sleep, and thankfully, Herb understood. Chapter 5 Wednesday, June 3, Sup RD, Slash Sup, 1852 Though my life has really taken a turn and things are very different than they were a week ago, I think it's good. 
I really enjoy spending time with Herb and getting to know him better, and it's nice to be with the other women and not have to drive all day any longer. My shoulders no longer ache like they did for a while, but the ache has taken up residence in my legs and feet instead. I enjoyed having Trudy over for supper last night, and when I knew what subjects to shy away from, the experience was truly enjoyable. I know Trudy is hiding something, but so am I. We all are, so it doesn't matter much what she's hiding, as far as I'm concerned. Oregon is for starting new lives, and she has a right to her secrets, just as I have a right to mine. Penelope made sure that Mrs. Gabriel, the widow who had been found on the side of the road, was with them as they walked the next day. She wanted to get to know the other woman so Mrs. Gabriel would feel as if she was a part of things, the same way Penelope now felt like she was part of the company. Who drives your wagon? she asked. My oldest son. He does a good job, and then I can mind the little ones. Mrs. Gabriel nodded to the small child walking beside them on the trail. Stanley has been my rock since my husband fell ill. I'm really not sure what I would have done without him. I can understand that. I'm very much looking forward to our supper tonight, Penelope said. I am too. Thank you for inviting us. We haven't really had the opportunity to spend much time with others without feeling burdensome. Penelope put her arm around the other woman's shoulders. You're not a burden at all. You are a wonderful woman, and I'm so happy to have the pleasure of getting to know you. Thank you, Mrs. Jensen. I'm feeling rather pleased to get to know you as well. Please, call me Penelope. Only if you'll call me Katie. Katie it is. Penelope was ever aware of Mary right behind her with her musket but she enjoyed her time getting to know Katie well. Just before lunch, there was a gunshot from behind her, and though Penelope jumped, she knew it meant fresh meat for at least Mary and Bob, and hopefully, for many others on the trip. Mary laughed and shouted excitedly, and Penelope turned around to see her struggling with a dough she'd shot. Penelope immediately went to help, and the two of them worked to get the deer hoisted onto the back of Bob's wagon yet again. Penelope was thankful the wagons moved so slowly as they plodded along the prairie. As soon as they finished their noon meal, the two couples, Bob and Mary and Herb and Penelope, spent their rest time carving up the animal and distributing meat. Penelope hadn't asked for meat that day, but she found that she was very glad to have it on another day with company coming for supper. It would help stretch her food as far as it could go. For supper, Penelope cooked the deer meat into a stew that she hoped would be enough for the group she was feeding. Knowing that Katie had a teenage boy, she was a little worried, but she really hoped they'd still have enough for lunch the following day. When the other family arrived, she was happy to meet all four of Katie's children and share food with them. True to her word, Katie brought a loaf of bread and a cake she'd made after they'd stopped for the evening. That smells delicious, Katie said. Your mother must have been a good cook. Penelope laughed. I don't think my mother has ever cooked anything in her life. We had slaves for that. She wasn't sure if she'd been able to conceal her bitterness when she'd mentioned the slaves. Sounds like you were brought up in a different way than most of us, Katie said with a smile. She put her arm around her oldest son. This is Stanley. He drives for us. It's nice to meet you, Stanley, Penelope said with a smile. I hope you're hungry, because I made a lot. Ma says I have hollow legs, Stanley said, grinning at her. I think most boys your age do. Penelope served the stew, and everyone took a bowl. She sat on a rock beside Herb and watched as everyone else chose other places to sit. The four children sat on the ground and Katie took another rock close to the fire. It's chilly this evening. Katie nodded. I think we have a storm coming in. We probably do, Herb said looking around. I think it's going to be a big one too. I guess we're sleeping under the wagon tonight. Stanley wrinkled his nose, and Penelope was sure he liked sleeping out under the stars. 
or in the wagon, Katie said. We won't all fit, Stanley said with a sigh. I guess you're all in the wagon, and as the man of the family, I'll be under it. Katie smiled at him. I guess you're right. Penelope hadn't realized how much Stanley had taken on since his father's death. The boy couldn't be more than fourteen, yet he was the one driving every day, and he offered to sleep out in the rain. You're a good man, Stanley. Stanley obviously noticed her change from calling him a boy to a man, because he preened. It's my responsibility. I'll go over with you after supper and see if we can make your wagon cover a little tighter to avoid getting water in there before the storm comes, Herb said, wanting to be there to help if he could. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, Stanley said. While they were off taking care of the wagon, Katie helped Penelope with the dishes while the children went to find their friends to play. Only the youngest stayed there, but Penelope had found out that he was always with his mother. He obviously didn't like to be away from her, and who could blame him? He'd just lost his father recently. He might worry his mother would disappear soon too. After the men finished, Stanley rounded up his siblings, and they ate the cake Katie had baked for dessert. This is delicious. Penelope said. I wish I could make something that tastes this good. I'm just learning to cook, and I feel like I'm very inept. You did a wonderful job with supper, Katie said with a smile. This is my mother's cake, and I've been making it since I was a little girl. Would you like the receipt? I would love it. Penelope saw that Herb was already on his second piece. She'd love to be able to bake something he enjoyed that much for him. After the Gabriels had left, Herb looked at Penelope. Would you like to walk with me? She smiled. Their walks had become precious to her. I would love to. Let me just wash up the knife I used to cut the cake, and I'll be ready. Since the water was still there from the supper dishes, it only took a moment. As they walked, she talked about Katie and how much she liked the other woman. She's sad, and you can see it at times on her face, but she's definitely being strong for her children. Did you know her husband died of a putrid foot and not from cholera? I didn't, but I'm not surprised, he said softly. It's a tough journey for anyone, whether they get cholera or not. He almost thought those who died quickly from the disease had it easier than those who lingered with it. He knew the journey was going to be a tough one, but he'd had no idea just how hard until they'd started out. When they were out of sight of the camp, Penelope turned to Herb and initiated their kiss. This was what she loved so much about their walks. They could kiss and show one another physical affection without anyone watching. Herb pulled her to him and his hands roamed over her body, touching her in places that she wasn't certain he had the right to touch, but he was her husband, so she didn't feel like she should stop him either. It was certainly a dilemma. His touch sent little fires through her body, starting at wherever his hand was and shooting straight to her core. I think I'm ready, she said when he pulled away. Granting him his husbandly rights no longer felt like something to be feared. Ready for what, he asked. Surely, she didn't mean what he wanted her to mean. I think I'm ready to make love with you, Herb. He gaped at her for a moment, surprised. I thought we were waiting another week. Not that he wanted to wait. He just didn't want her to feel coerced into something she wasn't ready for. Penelope frowned, looking down. Oh. I thought you wanted to, she was embarrassed that she'd brought it up if it wasn't something he wanted. She shouldn't have assumed. Oh, I do. I just don't want you to feel like I'm rushing you. I don't feel rushed at all. I feel like I've waited entirely too long. He frowned for a moment, thinking about the logistics of things. I don't feel safe bringing you out on the prairie to sleep tonight, not with that man still roaming around, and with a storm coming. If we were really quiet though, we could make love in the tent tonight. I can be quiet, she said. Then we'll do that. He took her hand and brought it to his lips. You are making me the happiest man on earth. 
I feel gifted every time you even smile at me, and making love with you will be a dream come true. She moved closer to him again, wrapping her arms around him. Thank you for supporting me through everything. You're my wife. What else would I do? As they walked back to camp together, she was both nervous and excited. Betty had given her good advice about this moment, and she was glad she wasn't going into it with just her mother's advice, which had been, close your eyes and think of the future of the country. Ugh. That had not been helpful at all. When they were back at camp, Herb made quick work of putting up the tent. Everyone seemed to be sleeping, or getting close to sleep, so he immediately got into their small tent and waited for her. As soon as she was in with him, he knelt in front of her, cupping her face in his hands. I hope you know what a joy and a blessing you are to me. Every day a little more. She smiled, a tear escaping her eye. This was so much different than it would have been with Reginald. Herb actually liked her for who she was, not for who he felt he could mold her into being. His lips went to hers, and she put her arms around him, already knowing she loved the kissing part of marriage. They slowly undressed one another, both of them reluctant to stop kissing, so it took much longer than it should have. Finally, when they were undressed and facing one another, the rain started pounding onto the oilcloth of the tent. And they were able to make love without worry someone would hear them. Afterward, she lay in his arms, her head against his shoulder. I feel like we should have done that on our wedding night, she said. I'm sorry I made you wait. I offered to wait, if you'll recall. He kissed the top of her head. Thank you for giving me the gift of yourself. And thank you for giving me the gift of you. All of you. You've been my fiercest protector, my helper, and my friend from the very beginning of this journey. I hope you know just how very much I appreciate all you've done. During the night, the storm became stronger, and they dressed and climbed into the back of the wagon amidst all of their belongings. They could see people around them doing the same. Storms like this made for rough travel, and she hoped it wouldn't last too long, but she was thankful she had stew left from the night before for them to eat if it did last a long time. They had to sleep sitting up in the wagon, because there was so little room, but she pillowed her head against his shoulder, and they snuggled close. When she woke it was well past dawn, but the rain was still coming down. Is this going to delay us? she asked. Herb shook his head. No, the captains have taken this sort of thing into account. We have a couple of weeks of rain days built into our schedule. That was the only thing the previous captain had been good about. Keeping them on schedule. Herb was thankful to him for that if for nothing else. While in the wagon they talked, and she opened up about the full story about Muriel. When I got the letter from her mistress, telling me that she'd had her whipped to death, I wept for days. I had to tell her mother, of course, and she threw herself on the floor, crying and screaming. My mother made her leave the house until she calmed down. Herb shook his head. That's terrible. I don't know how you were able to stay there for as long as you did. I didn't think I had a choice. I thought it was part of being obedient to my father in all things, like the Bible talks about. Leaving, well, it seemed wrong and I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't been expected to marry a man who was known for how poorly he treated his slaves and those around him. Rumor had it he beat his own mother for breaking a vase. A man like that would have been terrible to live with. Yes, he would have. Herb shook his head. I'm so glad you got out when you did. He couldn't imagine her flesh bruised by the hand of the man who was supposed to take care of her and cherish her as they became one flesh. I am as well, she said, snuggling closer to him, glad the whole story was finally out. Well, everything was out except for the jewelry she had stashed in the flower sack, but that could wait. The rain finally let up around noon, but when they got out of the wagon and looked around, everything was muddy, and the river had risen. I have a feeling we won't be moving on today. We won't, Bob called from the next wagon over. Applegate just made the decision. 
Thank you, Herb called back. I think we should be thankful for the fresh water. They ate the cold stew and sat for a moment, just enjoying a time to rest and not having to constantly move. A short while later, people started coming to Herb to have repairs made on their wagons and their oxen reshed while they were staying in place. Herb made sure Mary was watching over Penelope before he left, though he worried about her. Mary took the time to walk over and sit with Penelope. I should go hunt, but I'm spending time with you instead. She looked cross to be taken from her favorite pastime. We certainly couldn't dry meat today. It's too wet. No, but we could provide fresh meat to a lot of the camp for their suppers tonight, which I think would please everyone. You're right, Penelope said. Let's go hunt. Can you shoot? Mary asked. Penelope shook her head. Herb is going to teach me, but it's been kind of busy around here. I'll teach you. We have the whole afternoon to hunt, because we can't move on with all this mud all over everything. I'd like that. Mary got a pistol from the back of her wagon. I like this for protection more than a musket. She held it up to show Penelope. I'll teach you to use this, and you'll be able to keep it close. It's not nearly as heavy as my musket. The two women went away from camp and Mary carefully scanned the area around them. It's hard to have a target when there are so few trees, so I'm trying to find something else that would work. She loaded the pistol and carefully showed Penelope each step of the process, before handing her friend the gun. Do you see that knot in the grass? she asked, pointing to a spot just about 100 feet away. Penelope nodded. Yes. That's what I want you to aim for. Mary showed her how to point the pistol and line up her sight. It took her four tries, but Penelope finally hit her target. Mary squealed with excitement. You did it. Now hit it three more times, and then we'll find a new target. They worked on shooting for hours, and Penelope's arm was aching by the time they were done. That's enough for now, Mary said, taking the pistol. I'm confident you could do well enough to at least keep a man at bay. Since that would be her only goal, Penelope knew she'd learned what she needed to learn. I hope so, Penelope said. Should we hunt now? All that shooting has probably scared off every critter for a hundred miles, Mary said with a laugh. We'll hunt another day. Together, the two women walked back to camp and Penelope saw that Herb was waiting for her. I have a surprise, he said with a smile. What's that? I got a buffalo for supper. I've given away most of the meat, but there's enough left for our meal too. I sure hope you gave some to Bob. Mary's provided us with food a couple of nights in a row. I didn't because I was hoping you'd be willing to invite Bob and Mary over tonight. They've done so much lately that I want to thank them, and I get the impression Mary isn't overly fond of cooking. Penelope smiled. She doesn't seem to mind it too terribly much. I think she'd rather be hunting, but she'll cook when she needs to. Well, I'll go over and invite them if you don't mind. Not at all. I'm glad you thought of it. Penelope looked through the dried fruit she had in the back of the wagon and found some cherries she hadn't realized were there. Most likely they'd been purchased by Herb for his journey and she just hadn't found them yet. She quickly took them out to make a cobbler from. She knew she'd seen a cobbler receipt in the cookbook. By the time supper was ready, Mary and Bob had been there for a while visiting with Herb. Occasionally, Mary would help Penelope with something but for the most part, she let her friend do the hard work of cooking alone. I'll help with the dishes. Penelope nodded. Thank you for that, but you don't need to. This meal is our way of repaying you for your kindness. When she had finished, she put the food out for them. It was a simple meal with rice, gravy, and the buffalo meat cut up into chunks and served on top. There should be enough for their noon meal the next day as well, which thrilled Penelope. She liked being able to cook one meal and eat it twice. 
While they ate, Mary told the men about teaching Penelope to shoot that day, and they all laughed at some of their mishaps. I do feel like she could protect herself with a pistol easily now. Herb grinned. I plan to teach her, but I'm so glad you did it for me. I never seem to have time, and I do love my walks with my wife. I understand. Today there was nothing but time, so I showed her, and she's a quick study. Mary smiled at Penelope, who felt shy with the conversation being about her. I'll give you my pistol, to start carrying tomorrow then. Thank you, Penelope said. Mary shook her head. She's new enough to shooting that I think she'll do better if she uses the same pistol. I'll give her that one to use until she's out of danger. Herb nodded. You're probably right. I hadn't thought of that. When Penelope went to fetch the cobbler she'd made, Herb was excited. Cherry cobbler? That's my favorite. I found the dried cherries in the back of the wagon, and I didn't think you'd mind if I used them. You can use as many as you like to cook as long as you don't mind if I eat them. She laughed. You know I don't. She gave everyone a plate before sitting down to get eat her own. I hope it turned out all right. This is my first cobbler. Herb was the first to take a bite, and he smiled, nodding. Maybe a little more sugar next time, but I have a sweet tooth. I think it's perfect, Mary said. Especially for your first time making a cobbler. Penelope took a bite, and she found it a little too tart, just as Herb had. I think Herb is right, and it needs a little more sugar. I like things tart, Mary said. Bob shook his head. Doesn't surprise me at all. They all laughed at that, and then got down to the serious business of eating the cobbler. Mary was true to her word and helped with the dishes, while the men sat and talked about protecting Penelope. It seemed to be a conversation that they'd had before. I say we just need to finish the man and bury him so he can't come back, Bob said. I don't think that's a good idea. More and more men will just be sent after her. No, I think we need to find a way to get it back to her father that she's married, so he'll leave her alone. Maybe, Bob said, but he sounded skeptical. Penelope frowned, voicing her opinion for the first time. I think Herb is right. My father is a very stubborn man, and he'll keep sending people to find me until someone lets him know I'm married and under someone else's protection. She didn't want to think about what the consequences would be with both her father and Reginald if she went back to Virginia. Maybe, Bob said, but he didn't sound convinced. Of course, it didn't matter much what Bob thought about the whole situation. They would do what Herb thought was right since Herb was her husband. Thankfully, Bob and Mary seemed happy together, but Penelope couldn't imagine being married to anyone but Herb. They didn't walk that evening, because the mud was too thick to enjoy it, but they were hopeful it would dry out enough they'd be able to be on their way the following day. They went into their tent that night and as they lay there in each other's arms, they talked about the future. I do think we'll settle near the others, Herb said, and I'll set up a blacksmith's shop. It'll be good for the town and for us. And we'll get more land to homestead as a married couple, she added. Maybe we can let someone else use the land we don't need, he said. That could work. I want enough space for a kitchen garden, though. I think it would be nice to grow some of the food we eat. What did your family grow back in Virginia? Cotton. Reginald grew tobacco. Penelope frowned. Those crops really do need extra hands to work to keep it up. I know they do. I'm glad I'm not someone having to make a decision about using slave labor or not. She propped up on one elbow and looked down on him. Do you think you would use slave labor? He thought for a moment, but finally shook his head. No, I really don't think I would. Especially not with everything you said about Muriel. Penelope was able to settle down then. At least we agree. She was relieved she'd married a man with the same morals she had. It would make life easier for her.